Welcome. I'm Frank Conkling, and this is Panda Consulting's ArcGIS Parcel Fabric Workshop. Today, we're going to explore that description driven workflows. And the first question is so, so what does it mean, description driven workflows? It means that when you're looking to go and determine what tools should be used, that actually the type of legal description on the document really determines the tools and the workflows that you use to go and create those. So even though you've got a whole toolbox full of tools available to you, again, whatever type of description you're looking at on the document, that's going to really determine what you use and the sequence in which you use it. By the way, we've got a lot to cover today. I'm not even sure we're going to cover all of it today. We may have to split this into two segments. One, um, this workflow and or this workshop, and then the rest of it maybe in a follow-up workshop uh, next month. So let's let's talk about what types of legal descriptions are there. And there's really traditionally we break it down into three different types of legal descriptions. There is a meets and bounds description. A meets and bounds description is one in which you have a series of courses defined, giving you some sort of direction and a distance on there and, and hopefully some additional elements on there, defining what those points are supposed to be. That meets and bounds description is the one most people think of when they think about legal descriptions. Things like, beginning at this point and going for this bearing and distance to a point, another bearing and distance, those sorts of things. That's a meets and bounds description. And that has one specific set of tools that you use. And then there is another set of legal descriptions called an aliquot description. And we're gonna explore that a little bit more because there's really two different types of aliquot descriptions and the tools are different depending upon which one you do. And then the third type of description is a graphic description or one that references some other document that's stored somewhere. And these are things such as a subdivision plat or certified survey map if you're from Wisconsin or up in the upper Midwest. So let's talk about it. This is a meets and bounds description. And this up in here is just sort of the normal type of a beginning part of it. And it, it, it has a, a caption on it. But then it says basically overall where this thing is located in the southwest corner, quarter of the southeast quarter of the northeast quarter of the northeast quarter of the northeast quarter of a, a section 20. Obviously, this is within a public land survey system state or, or rectangular survey system state. This is not within any of the original colonial type system states. But more importantly, the way the meets and bounds description works is that it starts by attempting to describe the courses or the sort of a traverse that you would take to find the individual corners. And this, this is a nuance, and this is important, is that when it goes to describe these things, it describes, for example, a bearing along the east line of this for a distance of this to the point of beginning. That information that it provides in there is not the actual definition of where the parcel is located. Rather, it's a guide. And instead, they want you to find the corner that's out there. All right, so that if in fact, in this case, this, this north on this first area here, this north at zero one degrees, 18 minutes, 17 seconds west. If it turns, because it says along the east line of the southwest quarter of section 20, if it turns out that that bearing is not the same, it doesn't mean go on that bearing. It means go along the east line of said section 20 for distance to the point of beginning. So when you're looking at a meets and bounds description, what you wanna do is you wanna look for words such as, and let me see if I can point them out here, along and 
up here there's another one two you want to look for those words because those are going to tell you where this is actually supposed to be what the monument calls are in surveying jargon what the monument calls are for what the boundary of that parcel is supposed to be it also is supposed to tell you where the corner is located so if it turns out that that 72887 isn't going to an actual corner that's already been established it doesn't mean that it creates a gap or overlap between the parcels. It means that that's generally where it is. So when you have older descriptions that describe things in, in older linear units, whether it be yards or rods or perches or chains, that doesn't mean that those dimensions are less accurate. They might be less precise, but they're not less accurate because they're still telling you a general guide to where that corner might be. So again, and I recently was on a, a forum in which I was watching and listening and, and the people there were talking about, well, how many people map gaps and overlaps between the parcels? The reality is there should not be gaps and overlaps. If they understand how parcels are created, there should never be a gap or overlap. It just means that those dimensions, the bearings and the distances along the courses, those are elastic. They are meant to be adjusted to the corners that are in there. All right, so let's go ahead and look at sort of the tools that you use with a description such as this. Now, I recognize that in here, and the reason why I brought this is this is, this description actually, there was a missing course that they had to go and introduce. By the way, this is actually off of a recorded document. So they, they recognized that after this was recorded the first time that there was a portion of that description that was excluded, probably by mistake, hopefully by mistake. And they introduced it this way by, by going and typing that in there. So let's go now and look at and actually see about mapping this. now. Because I can't, I don't have enough screen space to include that full description up here and do the mapping inside of ArcGIS. I actually have it over on another screen. So you'll see me sort of looking to the side. It just means that I'm actually reading the description as I'm inputting it here. So let's go to the workflow. This is a workflow for the meets and bounds description. And there's a couple things you do, and this is inside the parcel fabric. So always, always you go and create a record. And in this case, I'm just gonna say this is a workshop demo, meets and bounds, all right? And the recording date, it doesn't matter what that is. I can use today's date on here to go and do that. And I really don't need to do anything else on here. So I've created a record. And again, to remind everybody what this record is really doing is it's just keeping track of what I create, what I delete. And it's organizing them around the global ID of a record polygon. Okay, so now the first thing that I'll do is I'll go and I'll start a traverse. And with this traverse, I'm going to go and input tax lines. Now remember again, the tax lines and whatever I choose here determines what type of parcel type eventually gets built. In this case, this is, I'm going to build a tax polygon. So let's get started. Let's put our, our starting point in. And in this case, let's zoom in here and start here. But if I look at my legal description, my legal description starts off with not the point of beginning, but it says commencing at. When it says commencing at, it means you have at least one course between um, the starting point and where it actually, the point of beginning, the actual parcel begins at. And so we're gonna use a connection line to go and input that. Before I start, and this is important, Let's go and bring this up again, just so we can see it. 
on here it says dense 11817 west along the east line of the southwest of, of 20. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the bearings that we input have are relative to the information that we have stored. So we're going to do that by using what ESRI calls the ground to grid correction, what we as surveyors think of as a basis of bearing. So in order to do that, we're going to go and click on here and say, enter the ground distance, enter the bearing that's in the description. In this case, this is 0, 01. 1817, and this is the Northwest Quadrant. And then it's gonna say, click on the start point of the grid. In this case, I just wanna go and tell it that that's the line. That's the line. Notice I didn't put anything in a scaling portion of it. I only put something in there for the bearing. So it recorded the difference between what I'm gonna be inputting and what it says so on our current data. And it still says our, our display or our distance factor is one. So it's not going to scale it up or scale it down. So now let me begin, begin. 1, 18, 17, Northwest. All right. For a distance of 727.87 feet to the point of beginning. Now, again, when you're, when you're going through a meets and bounds description, as soon as you see the point of beginning, it means that you're no longer inputting connection lines. You are inputting actual boundary lines on here. So we put in here, change our template from connection lines to boundary lines, and we then use the next bearing. In this case, this is 88 degrees, 41 minutes, 43 seconds. And this is Southwest, which is the third quadrant for 120.51 feet in here. All right, now we proceed to the next one, which is 504700 Northwest, 126.58 feet is our next call. Then 343204. Northwest, 107.99 feet is the next call. And one, 1817 Northwest, 312.54. All right. Then 27.35.50 Northeast. 239.35 feet. And if you look at this description again, by the way, that was that inserted line there. It says to the center line of Hillcrest Drive. All right. So if I'm looking at this, I then, oh, okay, this is on the center line of Hillcrest Drive. So we're in the right place. We're where we should be on here. So let's continue with this description. And let's look at this for a minute. Dense easterly 329 or 323.90 feet along the center line and the arc of a curve to the left, having a radius of, of 572.69 and a chord of which bears 74.58.25 east, 319.60 feet. All right. So when often when people get to that, they freeze. It's like, well, what do I input here? What we're going to do is we're going to input the cord bearing, then we're going to input the radius, and then we're going to probably input the arc length on here. All right. So again, we're going to input the cord bearing here. And this is the cord bearing that was called out was 74 degrees, 58 minutes, 25 seconds, southeast. Before we hit enter on this, we're going to make sure that we note that this is a cord bearing. So we're going to use the shortcut CB. It does not matter whether it's capitalized or lowercase, just CB. And we're going to hit enter. 
As far as distance, we're going to hit zero. For the curves, it's always zero. And then next is the radius. We're going to input the radius value here. The radius on here is 572.96 feet. And since this is a radius where the radius point is to the left side of this line, or this is the line we're going to go through here, the radius is on this side of it or the left side of the line. It's going to be a negative radius on here. And then finally, we're going to input, in this case, it's looking for the arc length, which was the first bit of information on here. Actually, it's the last bit of information. 319.60 feet is the arc length on here. So when we go and input that, that's going to go and put the cord in there, or excuse me, the curve in there, and allow us to continue from that point forward. Recognize in here that the bearing that it goes and provides you is actually the bearing coming out tangent to that curve that you just input. In this case, it says that's eight, 88.4954 north to east along the center line of that road, a distance of 1661 feet on here. Then it says 220. 29 southeast 328.25 feet is our distance. Then it's 84, 58, 13. This is southwest 169.38 feet to that line again. Thence 11817 southeast along that line, 265.55 feet. That should take us to the point of beginning, if I've done this correctly. And I have not, I've put something in here differently. Eighty-four fifty-eight thirteen southwest one sixty-nine thirty-eight two twenty twenty-nine southeast three twenty-eight eighty-eight forty-nine fifty-four northeast sixteen point six one seventy-four. Um, 74, 58, 25 southeast for cord bearing of 319.60 on here. All right, so I'm going to go and tell it, just go ahead and close this. So I'm going to use some of these new functions in here. I'm going to tell it that's my closing. And it tells me it's four feet off. I'm going to look at some of the closing functions in here. And it's going to tell me how much these are adjusted. I have several options. I can say just snap the last one, go to compass, transit, or Crandall rules. These really, one does the bearings, one does the distances, and the other one does a combination of the two. Let's go ahead and just use compass and tell it to go ahead and adjust this to close. There it is, and it closes it. So I'm now going to get off of Traverse Tool. So before we move any further, what I want to do is I want to make sure that, that we understand. Usually when I'm going and talking about this, I have someone say, well, Frank, I understand that you used that ground to grid. Do we have to use that every time? And the answer is no, you don't have to use it every time. But if you do use it, it minimizes the amount of rotations or movement that you have to do because it, it takes whatever that description is and modifies those 
so that it fits within your data, at least fits with, as, as it relates to bearings. Bearings are notoriously some of the hardest things to get fit because there can be so many different ways you can reference a direction or a bearing. It can be referenced to true north. It can be referenced to magnetic north. It can be referenced to a grid north. Could be referenced to a grid north that's not the grid that you have. It could be referenced to an assumed bearing. So it's always a best practice to go and use the ground to grid, or again, the basis of bearing correction within your traverse. It's just always good practice to do. All right, once we've created this, and this is all of our lines inside of here, just to show you, if I go to my record and say, show me everything that was created as part of this record, it will show me my connection line, all of my traverse lines through here. So there is everything that's part of my current record. I also usually have a question, well, has it changed any of those bearings or distances? Has the adjustment changed any of those bearings and distances that you input? And the answer is no, it has not. Matter of fact, let's look at this in here and let's look at our lines. And it says, here's the bearings and distances that I input. Interestingly, it also recorded that these were entered. These were not inverse, these were not calculated. So the parcel fabric goes and makes sure that it, it records how this dimension was derived. Was it something that was entered? And the options, by the way, are entered from geometry or computed. Entered means that I keyed it in as part of my COGO input. From geometry means that it was calculated by inversing that, that line to say, well, calculate what that is. And so when you use update COGOs, it actually goes and marks those lines as being from geometry, not being entered in there. And then finally, the last option here is computed. Computed is when you have an existing line in here and you go and tell it, or you, you build a new parcel here and you tell it to clip those lines. When you tell it to clip a line, it goes and calculates or computes what the remainder of the line is using that Kogel value that's in there at that moment. So those are the three options. Again, by default, when you're using a traverse or when you're going and inputting any of these with Kogo, it marks that information as being entered for that. All right. So I've, I've put this in here now. The next question is, how do I make sure that it's in the right place? Because, well, actually the next thing I need to do is I need to create a seed. So I'll go ahead and click on create a seed and let's make sure that my seeds are on. And I think I see one here. So let's go ahead and build this. Let it go and build it for us. And let's make sure. Oh, I wonder if it did not build this because it didn't close. It did not close. I did not tell it to adjust it all the way at the end. So it didn't create a seed for me. I know this is sloppy, sorry but I'm gonna go and just manually close it this time in the sake of getting this thing done. All right. And I'm just gonna go and delete that point there. All right. So now let's go and create a seed. Sure enough, there's our seed. There's our build. All right, let's get off of edit vertices. Let's go to some other tool. All right, so I now have a parcel that's in here and it's built and I can do a parcel adjustment. In this case, if I look, there's not a whole lot of things here that I'm, I'm joining to. 
There's this down here. So let's go ahead and, and click on this. See, this is within five feet. We wanted to adjust to the center line here. We wanted to adjust here, but there's not much else because this is a new parcel. On here, we wanna make sure that it goes and closes out to this point here. All right, so we'll go ahead and just tell it rather than generating things because there's not a whole lot of things in here for it to go and, and link to. We can tell it, go ahead and add a link. This is our active record. We can tell it, why is it? We have five feet here. Let's go and make this five foot here so that this is the point to edge snapping or this is sort of what you would normally do with this. And again, this is not a great one to go and show for aligned parcels in here. I probably should have worked that through beforehand. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and tell it to go and input this and use the not aligned parcels, but aligned features. And I'm gonna go and tell it to go ahead and align it so that this curve is here and it goes to, it matches this. So it's gonna modify this parcel so it fits against that road center line for Hillcrest on there. So we can see it's here. The question is, did it modify my Kogo? And the answer is no, it still has not modified the Kogo. It's kept it exactly as I input it. It just moves slightly that feature so it matches up exactly on here. So I now have my parcel in place. The tools I've used so far have been the ground to grid, the traverse tool, create seeds, the build, and then either the aligned parcels or the aligned features to make it fit where it should fit. My next option is a clip routine. Let's go in here and click on clip now. With clip, we have two options here. They're all defined by the bottom as far as how you wanna do this. If we tell it to clip all editable layers, we want to make sure that we turn off any layer that we may have turned on. So it only is going to clip against the actual parcel layers. In this case, only against the parcel layers here. Everything else is turned off. I can tell it, go ahead and clip that out. and it will go and clip them. So this, by the way, is a parcel fabric that was migrated and it's gone through a couple things. So I probably have some line features here that are not correct. If I look at this, it does have a created by, and it is on here, so it should have clipped that out. Let me just in, in the sense of making sure I get this thing correct. Let me go and split that line right there. And let me go and take this, not my parcel, just that, and then go and mark that historic by deleting it. Okay. All right, so I now have my parcel. It has gone in here. It has calculated my misclosure 
and record at that minus closure distance. And it's calculated all the acreage that I had set up for it. So the meets and bounds description is probably the toughest of all of the descriptions that you want to put in because there's so many different tools that you may wind up using. Again, you want to make sure that the bearings are, are corresponding to the, your data set. So you use your ground grid. Make sure that the traverse tool goes and records all of your bearings and distances for creating that the lines for that parcel as laid out on here. Make sure that they close correctly. Make sure that um, you create a seed and then build the seed to go and, and create um, the parcel. And then make sure you clip it and make sure you're only clipping what you really need to clip on here. So again, it's fairly convoluted, but it is probably one of the more standard ones that you'll be using as far as how to go and do this. Are there any questions about meets and bounds descriptions? And by the way, that's pretty standard as far as the sequencing of the tools that you're gonna use for a meets and bounds description. All right, I don't see any in here. So let's talk about the next type of description that you're going to be encountering. Um, so Mark says, what do you do if some of the bearings are inaccurate? Copies from an old, old description, while others are very accurate. We have some where they presume that the east line is a 90 degree angle from north. Mark, that's actually a great description, or a great question, because and let me go back here for a minute. Because what happens is when we go and build this, and, and I didn't get a chance to do it because it's just sort of floating out here on this parcel here, but I'm going to create another record just to go and show you. And I'm just going to create a, a, a just a regular old record here. So if I have a description, a legal description. And I'm just going to create lines. I'm not going to put the Kogo on there, but I'm going to show you that if I go and have a legal description that defines this line and it references that line here and it uses a different bearing and then it has a highly accurate bearing here, another one here and another one here, another one here. Oh, duh, Frank, let me use a two point line here. But gives you the, you know, the COGO values that are stored on here represent something other than what's really shown here. And again, it doesn't matter whether the bearings are accurate or inaccurate in here. It just matters that in fact, you've got um, a reference that says that this line is supposed to be, or, or let me take that back, not that this line, but this corner, because in mapping legal descriptions, especially meets and bounds descriptions, it's all about locating the corner. So I'm going to create the seed here, then I'm going to build this here. Once I've got it built, I am then going to go to a line and I'm going to go and expand this out. This is probably 35 feet here. Yeah, maybe 40 feet here, only because I just drew this real fast. So in here, even though the bearing might have been, and I'm putting big air quotes here, wrong, it might have been something that didn't match it. Again, the bearing and the distance are really nothing more than a guide. Nothing more than a guide to tell you how to get to that point so that it becomes very important to say that, that let's go and generate points in here. Oh, this is an old one here. So it, I don't have my Z values set on here. So in here, 
I would actually tell it that this point should go to here and this point should go to here and this point should go to here and this point should go to here. Again, bearings and distances are very, very low on the hierarchy of, of monument calls. The courses that are being called out are really just guides. They don't say that this is an exact dimension. They basically, it's implied that this is close, but it's never exact. Dimensions and bearings are always imprecise. They always should be adjusted to the existing data that you have or to if you know your data is really bad, then you can use them and adjust your old data to the new. But for the most part, everything, everything in here should be adjusted to your existing known points on here. All right. Um, also, Rebecca has a question on here. So within the parcel fabric that we have here, let me go in and just sort of uh, undo this here. Rebecca says, what does, what does create C do? All right, in the parcel fabric, the parcel fabric is um, a, a complete parcel mapping tool and it's a solution. And what it does is it goes and keeps track using what's called a record and it keeps track of, let's get off this, keeps track of every line that I draw. And then when I tell it to create a seed, it evaluates whether or not those lines form a closed polygon. And it then symbolizes it. So it signifies to me, this, this does create a closed polygon. So when I click on create seed, I can see, oh, that is a closed polygon here. So that's a real parcel. If, however, I were to go and again, remember, I have a record which is keeping track of everything. I would go in here like I did last time and have something that didn't close. Go back here to two point line. This does not close, by the way, because if I tell it to go ahead and show me everything that's associated with this record, I can see there's a gap between these two. So if I tell it to go and build the seeds now to create the seeds, it's not going to create anything here. But if I do go in here and say, let's put a line here and track that also. Then when I say create seeds, it says, oh, you've got two closed polygons on here. So the parcel fabric structure allows me to quickly identify where I have lines that mathematically are closed and create um, a closed polygon versus where I just have lines that don't close on themselves. All right, so again, there's, there's just, um, that's what create seed does on here. But Mark, that was a great question on here. Wait, I missed a button to show everything. Create it with the record. Sorry. So inside here, this is this is what's what's called the heads up display for parcel fabric, and it's only if you have a parcel fabric in your project. And what that does is, if I go down here and open this up with the settings, I have here. It says select the features in my currently active record. So when I click on that, it will go and select everything in my active record on here. So it shows me what it's keeping track of. Or on a more low, lower level, it shows me everything that has this global ID of this polygon attached to their created by record here on here. Every one of them have this exact same global ID on it. That's how it keeps track of it. Here, here. So those are all the seeds also. So it's 
Each of these have that same created by record. And again, this is the global ID of this polygon that I told it to create. That's how it keeps track of what you create together with what you delete. Because when I delete it with this record active, it then marks this in that record. So the parcel fabric keeps track of what you create, what you delete, and helps you to build things because it then tells you what's closed, what's not closed. And it uses that as sort of a quick and easy way to go and, and capture things and, and define things as a transaction on here. All right, good questions, thank you. So let's go to an aliquot. These are the fun ones because it's not as complex as the meets and bounds courses. An aliquot description, aliquot is, is definitely, it's a French word and it means portion of another so that it's a portion of something else. But there's really two different aliquot descriptions types. One is if you are in a public land survey system um, where it describes something according to these Northwest quarter of the Northeast quarter of the Northeast quarter of section 19. In this case, in this case, aliquot means half of. So when it says the Northwest quarter of the Northeast of the Southeast of 19, what that's really saying is, and uh, let's go over here to a bookmark. This is a PLSS aliquot in which if we wish to go and describe the Northeast of, I think that's what it was, the Northwest of this, the Northwest of the Northeast of the Southeast. In order to go and create that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a, a new record and call this aliquot PLSS. So again, it's gonna start keeping track of what we create and what we do. So when we do this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and select that polygon that we're taking the portion of. In this case, it turns out that this is the entire Northeast of blah, 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 blah. So now what I can do is I can say, well, let's do a copy lines two. And we're gonna use this to create a tax parcel. And I'm gonna tell it a couple of things. One, the copy lines two says, we realize you're gonna use these lines to go and build something. So in order to make it easier for you to see, we're gonna only show you that information that's part of this record that we create. That's what this first button is, this first checkbox. The other checkbox is, it's going to create a seed when I do copy lines to. It's going to show me that there's a seed because it is closed lines. Do I want to preserve the attributes of the existing one or do I just want it to give it a, 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 a blank one for me? I'm just going to tell it, go ahead and preserve these and show me this. Now, since I did not change the parcel type when I said copy lines to, it automatically went and took the one that I had selected and marked that as historic. Didn't delete it, just marked it as historic. So that now when I go and build this thing, that's marked historic. And this new, this new portions of these will become and marked as, as my current ones. So let's go ahead and move this out of the way because that's right now in the middle. All right, so I'll go and I'll move this. So now, with a PLSS, aliquot description, what it really means is to take this line, divide it in half, take, let's get off of move, take this line, divide it in half, this line, and this line. So to develop something in half, all right, you want to have lines all the way. You don't want to have any breaks in these lines. You want to have the entire line in here. 
and you want to divide each of them in half. And then you want to go and connect those lines up. Let me first say that this is a PLSS. I did not check to see where this was located. And these rules that I'm telling you right now, they apply for a majority of the PLSS, but not every instance. For example, if this was on the upper tier, it, if this was on the north half of the upper tier of sections, one through six, this wouldn't apply. It, it's different in certain areas because of the way the, the PLSS is built. But for most uses, this will apply. So I'm gonna take these four lines and I'm gonna use the divide tool. And I don't wanna do that anymore. I'm gonna divide it into equal parts. I'm gonna take each of these lines and divide them into two parts. One of the nice things about 2.8 is that I can take multiple lines and divide them all at one time and say, divide this into two parts and it will automatically divide that into two parts. When I'm done here, those are each divided in half. Then my next step is to go and create new tax lines connecting this line and this line. And these are basically corners that I'm I'm splitting and connect this one and this one. All right, and those are corners that I'm building. I'm then gonna select those and I'm going to planarize them. Let me go to planarize them. All right. Yep, so um, Mark just put a comment in that said, um, I think Esri put out an idea on my behalf so that you could divide them by mixture of units, saves me from manually calculating rods to feet. Let me make sure that um, I show you something, Mark, on here before I get done. So on here, I've divided this into fourths and really I only needed this. I didn't need these divided. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and I'm selecting this line and I'm gonna select this line and I'm gonna delete it. And then I'm gonna create a seed. Let it check to see if I have closed polygons in here. I have a seed here and I have a seed here. And I'm gonna tell it, go ahead and build these and it will go and rebuild these two parcels. It's also gonna go and, and select those polygons. It's gonna go and turn on all my layers again. So on here, you can see this is a PLSS breakdown. And what I did with it is I selected, I did a copy lines two. I then took those lines and divided them accordingly. I connected up the lines I need to. In this case, I created the center of this 16th of a section. And I created a new polygon here and a new polygon here. All right. So that helps a lot. For PLSS aliquot, this is the way to go. This also, for example, if I were to go and say, well, really what it says is describe the east half of the northwest, of the northeast, of the southwest of this. And I would do the same thing. I would go and say, okay, copy lines two, my tax parcels. It would go and create those, turn everything else off, in this case, since it's east half versus west half, and again, it's showing me these other things because it's all part of that same component here, I can go and say, go ahead and move, let's do it this way, move that over to here. One more time, Frank. Let's go ahead and move that over to here to go ahead and finish the move on here. And now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take these two lines, halves and halves, and I'm not gonna take that polygon, I'm only gonna take those lines, divide them, and I'm gonna divide them in equal parts, two equal parts, divide them, 
get off the divide tool, go to create and create a line that connects this and this. And here, I'm gonna create the seeds. I will now have a new seed there and I will say build and it will build now the east half and the west half of that PLSS. All right, again, if it's part of a PLSS, if it's a sectional breakdown, you don't use any of the traditional type of aliquot tools. You, di you divide the lines in half, connect them up, and then you go and build them. And the reason why you actually have to take the lines, and, and I'll, I'll sort of do a little distraction here just to show you, um, just to do it as sort of an abstract. Within PLSS, if I were, if I had a polygon that was along a lake area, I might have a sectional area, something like that. And when I say north half, south half, it doesn't mean area. It means go and take this line, divide it in half, and be sort of the combination, the, the average of these two bearings to go over here and intersect that. That's how you go and do a PLSS breakdown inside of here. Any questions on that? Let's go in and answer Mark's question. Under units here, under distance units, all right, by default, if you look at this and if you note, if you're working inside of a PLSS area, what's missing here is they don't have rods, they don't have chains, they don't have these other elements in here. Well, in order to add them, it's very, very simple. You just click on this unit and say, you wanna add chains and you wanna go and do rods on here and whatever else you wanna do. If you're in Texas, maybe you wanna do Varus. They don't know a Vara, there's a Vara. So you can add these units here um, to your project file just by going into the options, units, and distance units and adding them to make them available for you if you want to do a split by or measurement by those there. So remember that you can actually add those on here. Uh, you may or may not, you just want to check that out on there. All right. So in this case, I went and did a division of this. I, I created the Northwest of the Northeast of the Southeast of 1911-18 on here. Showed you that the PLSS aliquot is a distance measurement. So the other type of measurement, the other type of an aliquot is, is not PLSS, but it defines something as a distance the north 500 of the east 450 of the southeast quarter of this, of this, of this. Ah, these are fun. So let's go and let me go to my bookmarks here. Let's go here. So now if I have this and let's go and create a new record just to make sure we don't write over everything else. Let's turn this off here. All right, so now what I wanna do is I wanna do the North 500 of the East 450 of this thing right here, this thing right here. How do I do that? There's a different tool that gets used with this. This is actually a divide tool. So now I can take and I've selected that polygon and I can tell it that I wanna divide it by widths. And I wanna divide that polygon so that it is north 500, 500 feet. And then I tell it what line I wanna go according to and it will divide that up. 
So we'll go and create that division. Now, let me go and select this and say that I want to divide now the East 450 of that parcel. And I want to use this line here. I can divide that. So this is the North 500 of the East 450 of this. So then what I need to do is just go and merge these together into an existing one. I can use this one for it and merge these two together. And I used the divide tool when I had distance on here, not PLSS, but a distance, a north 300 of the east 450 or whatever, that sort of thing. Since I'm in a parcel fabric, I want to make sure that structurally everything is in place. For example, that every line has points on the end of it, all polygon have lines on them, those sorts of things. So I will just do a build and tell the parcel fabric, check out everything that's in my current record and make sure that I have all my lines and points and everything I need on here. Again, that's the one of the beauties of the parcel fabric is it makes sure that everything is structurally sound. Any questions on this one? This aliquot by a distance. Okay, by the way, when we do that aliquot by distance, you can either select a, an, a line or you can draw your own line if you wanted to go and do it that way. However, one thing you cannot do is you cannot use a curve or you cannot use a, a box or any sort of issues in here. So let's look at one more thing here before we get to this. What happens if you want to do the northerly 200 feet of this parcel here? How do you do that? What well, turns out that rather than using that divide tool, because the divide tool, that divide tool only lets you create a straight line or draw one on your own. So you can't use this divide tool for that. Instead, what you would do is you could use the, uh, let me go and see where are you here, the split tool, in which you would tell it to split what you trace. Tell it, this is allow splitting without a selection that we want to make sure that it has a selection on it. And then this is where it gets a little tricky. This is more advanced. We want to tell it to trace that, that line, that northerly line here, trace this line, but do an offset to the line. So we're going to start here and we're going to tell it to trace, but we're going to type O and do an offset. And I said 200 feet on here, all right, and I'm gonna tell it tab to make sure that it goes and, and doesn't, there we go. To go and split that parcel that I have selected right now using a trace offset on here. And when I hit okay, it will go and split this out and create an aliquot breakdown by a distance along a curve on here. We go and select that line. That line's not real anymore. There's my overall line on here. And I can delete that line if I want. I could tell the parcel fabric to go ahead and build this. So make sure that it goes and builds the point and builds these lines in here for me. There you go. So it goes and builds those. I could actually go and select those lines and I could tell it to go ahead and update the Kogo on them. And then if I tell it to go ahead and label, it will give me the Kogo values for here. So it is now four o'clock. So we did fit this all in an hour. 
Do we have any questions on here or any suggestions or anything you'd like me to show you? The one thing I did not cover today is the graphic description. And the graphic description is actually a combination of these. So for example, the subdivision, you would use the meets and bounds driven workflow to create the boundary of that polygon, put it in place where it's supposed to go, clip out what's underneath it. And then once you have that polygon drawn, then you would go and do an aliquot breakdown for everything else underneath, for all the lots, for all the rights of way. And I think we're gonna to have to hold off on this until the next um, ArcGIS Parcel Fabric Workshop next month, and we'll show it to you then. All right. Thanks for attending, and we hope you enjoyed this workshop. If you have questions, would like some more details about anything we discussed during this workshop, or if you or anyone at your organization would like information about training, support, or ways in which we can help you with your GIS needs, please contact me at frank at pandaconsulting.com or call me at 561-691-3277 and we can discuss how we can help you with your needs.